Rene Descartes is sometimes called the father of modern philosophy, extremely prominent figure in the history of philosophy, and his contributions are wide and varied. We're going to focus in on his contributions to epistemology from his famous work, Meditations on First Philosophy. Now, usually when I'm considering a philosopher in history, it's important to know who came before him and who might have come after him. For René Descartes, his, his timing there, born in 1596 and, and died in 1650, those dates are, are really important for other reasons. This is the early modern era. His life overlapped with Isaac Newton and John Locke, who was born in 1632. And Descartes was considered the inventor of, of course, Cartesian geometry, which was a precursor to calculus, which came in later in the century. Descartes lived in a time where there was great global changes going on. Before, during his life, there were a lot of things going on that, that bothered him, that, that changed what he was learning as a child, for example. When he was later an adult, he realized he was wrong. Knowledge was expanding at, a, at an accelerating rate. And so, for example, the telescope was invented in 1608 during Descartes' lifetime. So for the first time, they didn't have a telescope that looked like that, for sure. But for the first time, they could have a closer examination of the planets. and and other stars and, and see celestial bodies in a new way. The microscope was invented by Leeuwenhoek in 1674, so it was a little after Descartes, but they were getting better at looking at the microscopic world even before technically the microscope was invented. And there were all kinds of global changes going on, mass exploration of the world. The map of the world when, when Descartes was a child would have looked a lot different from the map of the world when Descartes was writing this piece in the 1640s. So things are changing dramatically. Things that he once was taught in school, he now realizes were wrong. And so as he, he traveled, he realized so much of what he was taught turned out to be false. But for example, just in his lifetime, they recognized that the sun does not revolve around the earth, but the earth revolves around the sun. They realized with the exploration that the world was a lot larger than they thought it was. So all kinds of things going on that really bothered him. And because of this, Descartes developed a strategy. And his goal in this strategy uh, was to find a solid foundation for knowledge. That's what he wanted to do. He wanted to believe things that he could count on, that wouldn't be shown to be false a few years later. And he really wanted to avoid any error in his beliefs. So that's his overall big picture goal, right? His, his goal is a positive one. He wanted a solid foundation for knowledge. He wanted to be able to trust what he could believe. So his method in attaining that goal is systematic doubt. So what he wanted to do, he took some time, he took the opportunity, it was kind of like a sabbatical for him, and he withdrew to himself in a cabin in the woods where it was quiet and he could just carefully reflect on what he knew to be true and what could be false. So he wanted to just wipe out any possible errors. Anything that he believed that could be false, he was going to doubt it. And then his purpose, his goal, was to rebuild on a bedrock of what is certainly true. And so that's the methodology, right? His goal is not skepticism, but he uses skepticism as a method in order to get to that sure foundation of knowledge. So think about how we form belief. So just for your own sake. These are things that I believe are true, and I think most of these things are things that you believe are true. 
but think about how you know these things as we list them. So how do you know that humans have been on the moon? How do you know that Hurricane Maria devastated Puerto Rico? How do you know that Michael Jordan played for the Chicago Bulls or that the Great Pyramids are in Egypt? That England had a king once called Henry VIII that the capital of the state of Illinois is Springfield, that the planet Jupiter is larger than Earth, that water is H2O, or that gold is more valuable than zinc, that Seattle, Washington is larger than Macomb, Illinois, and that Lincoln lived in Illinois during his lifetime, and that tigers are mammals. So think about how you know these things. Why do you believe these things? So some of this is you've seen video, right? Humans landing on the moon. That you've seen video of the Hurricane Maria devastating Puerto Rico. You've heard it on the news, maybe. You see old clips, you know from sportscasters, they mention Michael Jordan having played for the Bulls. You were taught in grade school, maybe, that the Great Pyramids are in Egypt. In history, from a textbook, maybe you learned that England had a King Henry VIII. You can look it up, or maybe have even visited Springfield, Illinois, to see the Capitol building. But you could also, you know, look it up if you're outside Illinois. Maybe you've never been there and thought about it. You can just look that up. That Jupiter's larger than Earth. You were taught that in science class at one point. That water is H2O, the same. You were taught in a chemistry class, maybe. That gold is more valuable than zinc. Not sure where you might have learned that. Maybe early on from your parents, for example. That Seattle's larger than Macomb, that Lincoln lived in. You learn these things from textbooks, from news sources, from history books, from chemistry class, from reading about it, from watching videos. These are all the variety of ways that you come to have beliefs. Now, so we need to ask though, have you ever heard anything on the news that turned out to be false? Well, here's a case in the year 2000, the, during the presidential election, CBS called the election for Al Gore and said that he was elected president. Now that's a reliable news source, CBS, but that turned out to be false. The problem is news sources, no matter how reliable they are, they sometimes make mistakes, especially trying to be the first to break a story. Videos, of course, that you've seen can be faked, right? You've seen all kinds of crazy things on, in movies and videos, so you know that that, that can be faked. A, a teacher who's told you something can make a mistake, right? A textbook can be erroneous. A chemistry professor could be even wrong. It's possible, right? Uh, things that you've learned from a geography textbook, from your parents, from a teacher, from a video, from a, a reliable news source, the internet, broadly speaking, social media, all of these sources sometimes provide beliefs that are false, motivate beliefs that are false. So think of all the things you believe that could be false. Now here's what Descartes, who was in a similar situation and reflecting on this, realizing that his teachers, his textbooks, his sources of information could be in error, decided to thoroughly think through these challenges. And he came up with three challenges, three problems to beliefs. One was sense perception itself. So some of those things on that previous list, you know because you've seen it, right? It, that's is a major source for belief. You know where you are right now because you feel the chair you're sitting in or, or where, whatever it might be. You, you see the environment around you, so you form the belief that you are where you are. But Descartes noted that our senses can deceive us. Sometimes we hear something and we think it's one thing when it's not. Sometimes we see something that we 
form a belief on based on what we see, but we were wrong. So for example, water on the road in the sun. On a sunny day, you look ahead, it appears to be water in the road, but in fact, it's a mirage. There's no water there. Or maybe a friend from a distance. I saw someone once who uh, was walking around campus and they, they ran up past me and jumped on somebody's back because they were firmly believing that this was their really good friend. And uh, then it turned out not to be his friend. It was a very embarrassing moment. Fortunately, no fight broke out, but it, you sometimes mistake somebody's voice or, or their appearance initially for someone else. And uh, so Descartes says that people appear to be in coats could possibly be automatons. Descartes was quite imaginative, something that you wouldn't think he would have thought of, but we certainly would these days with our science fiction. So our senses can deceive us. And Descartes reasoned, since our senses can be mistaken, they cannot be the sure foundation of beliefs. So this means he's going to doubt anything from his senses. Now, ultimately, everything on that previous list that I mentioned came through your senses. The sources that we talked about could be in air, but even though they could be in air, even our senses could have been mistaken. We could have misheard a professor or a teacher. We could have mistakenly thought that our parents said something when they didn't. We could have watched a video not paying close attention and come to believe we saw something that we did not in fact see. So sense perception, our eyes, ears, nose, mouth, these fingers cannot be trusted, right? And then Descartes took a further swipe at sense perception. And he came up with the dream argument. And Descartes said, when we are dreaming, we're often unaware that we are dreaming, most often. So most people don't know, you don't know that you're dreaming when you're dreaming, you just accept the world the way it is as you're experiencing it in the dream. Now, while dreaming, we think we, think we are somewhere that we are not. So last night I had a dream. I, I dreamt I was in a gymnasium while I was actually in my bed. Uh, we think we're with someone that we're not with. We, we have all kinds of deceptive things going on, beliefs that are false. Now, here's what Descartes asked. How can you know that you're not dreaming right now? Now, think about it a little bit. Some dreams are very realistic. Some dreams are very vivid and clear. And sometimes even people dream so vividly and clearly, after they wake up, they're not sure if they actually did what they were dreaming, if that actually happened, or if it was a dream because it was so realistic. Now here's the problem. Maybe this now is one of those vivid dreams. Maybe you are dreaming right now. And sometimes people have what we might call embedded dreams. And Descartes kind of describes one. This, this would be one where, say, I've done this before, where I dream, I just mentioned being in a gymnasium. So I'm at a basketball game, and um, I'm supposed to be playing basketball. And then I might think to myself, oh, I'm too old and I don't do that anymore in a, in a crowd. And so um, I must be dreaming. And so within my dream, I wake up and I'm on my couch at home. And then I think, okay, that was a dream. I'm just sitting on my couch. I must have fallen asleep. And then I wake up and realize I'm in my bed. So within my dream, I dreamt that I woke up, right? And so Descartes is aware of this possibility. And so 
you can say, I know that I'm not dreaming because I, I woke up this morning, but sometimes dreams are like that, right? Even, and Descartes said, even in our dreams, mathematical truths are assured. So while this wiped out all things from our senses, you know, so that we can't believe and trust that we really are where we are doing what we think we're doing, we can't trust that. But Descartes noted, look, even in my dreams, triangles have three sides, all right triangles follow Pythagorean theorem, and so I can trust mathematical truths. And Descartes, as we mentioned, was a mathematician, and so this was a, a possible foundation for knowledge. But then, the third challenge. Descartes considers a possibility of an evil genius, a, a, an evil demon, as it's sometimes translated. And he ponders this. He, he ponders, what if God did not exist, but rather a deceiving evil genius was causing your beliefs? Or maybe even you're in a matrix, and the, the programmers of the matrix, if you know what I'm talking about, the simulated environment that's hardwired into your brain, Maybe they're deceiving you to, to make you think mathematical truths are in error. What if an evil genius made you think that two plus two equals four every time you thought about it, but in actuality, two plus two equals five? Maybe an evil genius can manipulate your brain, your thoughts, your mind so much that you have mistaken mathematical beliefs. And so if that were the case, we couldn't trust our senses, and we couldn't trust mathematical claims. Now, at this point, what's left, right? What's left that you could not possibly be wrong about, that could not possibly be doubted? We've wiped out just about every belief we have. Where else can we go? And here is Descartes' incredible answer. Cogito ergo soon. I think, therefore, I am. Now, this is the fundamental point of knowledge. This, from the Latin, cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Now, actually, that's the way it was put in uh, his other work, uh, but we're focusing on the way it was put in uh, Meditations on First Philosophy, but we're borrowing now uh, the phrase that he uses when he did this project elsewhere, um, and I don't want to confuse it with different names here, so uh, meditation of first philosophy, but the idea was the same. I think, therefore I am, right? And so here's the argument. Here's the reasoning process. If I'm doubting my senses, the reliability of my senses, or if I'm considering the possibility that I'm being manipulated, by an evil demon or an evil genius. Well, what's going on when we're doing that? And Descartes says, well, I'm thinking. I have to exist in order to do this thinking. It's me that's thinking. I'm doubting. I'm in this process. So here is something that I cannot possibly doubt. I exist. I cannot doubt that truth. In my doubting, it affirms I'm existing. And so Descartes finds that foundation for knowledge. Now, before I go on and talk about how that all works, you know, how do you get back to mathematical truths and, and sensory perception and relying on those, I want to mention something else that he does in this work because he, he ponders the wax. So let's think about what he's doing here with the wax. What is the significance of the wax? First, he has some beeswax, right, from a, from a honeycomb. And he has the honeycomb. He notices the hexagonal uh, structure to it. He holds the wax. He ponders its physical characteristics, right? So we have that structure. It's it's somewhat hard, right? It's solid. If you tap on it, it makes a 
a hollow sound when you tap on it. You can smell it. It's fragrant. It's shiny when you look at it. You can even taste it and taste the sweetness of it. So the way it looks, the way it sounds, the way it smells, all of these things have a certain characteristic. But then Descartes brings it closer to the fire. And as he does so, it loses all of the previous traits. It's no longer solid. It melts. It's malleable. It's no longer solid. It doesn't make a sound when you thump against it with your finger. It, it smells different. The fragrancy is gone. It's no longer shiny. It's more dull looking. Now, here's a question that he asked. How do I know that it's the same piece of wax? It has none of the physical characteristics that I sensed. So how do I know it's the same piece of wax? And his answer to that is, of course, only by knowing it in my understanding, only by knowing it in my mind, not by my senses. My senses tell me this is a something completely different than what I was holding a minute before. My senses tell me this is not the same thing, but I know it's the same thing. I know that in my mind. And the significance here is that what is inside our mind, so to speak, is more reliable. It's more reliably known than what we know from our senses or the what we might call the external world. Now, this is going to be really important for philosophy and the philosophers that come after Descartes. We have this inner world that we're more confident about, and then we have an external world that we know from our senses. And so that is a significant distinction that he makes in day two with the wax. Now, as a quick review, let's Consider, uh, this is not original with me by any means, but Descartes' kind of foundation for knowledge. What does it look like now that the project is completed? We have at the point of the inverted pyramid his sure foundation of knowledge. The one thing that couldn't possibly be doubted, I exist. Now in this video, we're not going through the argument for God's existence. I'll just roughly, very, very roughly describe it as such. Descartes says, okay, now that I know I exist, what else is in my mind? And he thinks, well, I have this mind, in my mind, this idea of God. And this idea of God is so great that I couldn't possibly have come up with it. Somewhat similar, but certainly not the same as Anselm's ontological argument. If you want to look at that video, Descartes has a similar project going on. So he, he has this reasoning to the fact that God exists. So now he knows I exist and he knows God exists. And then he continues his reasoning process like such. If God exists, then I don't have to worry about the evil genius deceiving me. God is not a deceiver. So I can trust my mathematical mind. Now, that doesn't mean I'm infallible, but I can trust mathematical truths. Those are reliable. I can know that two plus two equals four. I'm not wrong about that, that all triangles have three sides, etc. And Descartes, being brilliant, can be confident of much more uh, complex ideas in mathematics. And then from there, since God is not a deceiver, he doesn't broadly put us in situations where our senses are mistaken. So our senses are generally reliable. God would have made us so that our senses give us a roughly accurate picture of the world. Sure, we're fallible again. We can make mistakes. We can hear a voice and think it's somebody else. But broadly speaking, we can be confident that we're awake, that we're sitting in a chair, that we have this screen in front of us, that we're watching a video. So Descartes builds back up from his sure foundation that one point, the I think therefore I am, the point that I exist, and he builds back up 
to being able to trust, broadly speaking, other things. Now, this doesn't mean that everything a professor says or his teacher says or his parents said were true. It doesn't mean that he can rely on all his senses, as we talked about at the beginning. But it does put him back into a situation where he can get around in the world again and have a roughly stable existence. So in summary, what Descartes does in this project is he provides a case for rationalism, why you should trust what's going on in your mind more than your senses. He also provides tools for the skeptic. So if you watch the introductory video on epistemology and skepticism, you saw that Descartes' argument, of course, not coincidentally, is extremely similar to an argument from, to skepticism based on the movie The Matrix. And he certainly presents a challenge for the empiricists to address this concern about your senses and, and how those could be the basis for your beliefs. And so extremely important in philosophy. This is one of the reasons that Descartes is called the father of modern philosophy.